Hello, my name is James Richards. I'm a developer support engineer at Atlassian. And today I'll be talking about migrating apps from server to cloud. I joined Atlassian in 2015 in the support team as a senior support engineer for Confluence Server. In 2019, I moved into engineering to join the Confluence Cloud migration team and help build the Confluence Cloud migration assistant. In 2020, seeing a need, we created the app migration team to develop the app migration platform, which I'll be talking about today. In 2021, I combined both my support and engineering skills by moving into a developer support role, specializing in supporting partners, building their app migration code. Today, we'll be covering four areas, the server side of app migration, the middle bits of app migration, the cloud side of app migration, as well as some common pitfalls and questions. But first, when we talk about server to cloud app migration, we're talking here about on server Jira and Confluence and the P2 app, and in cloud, Jira and Confluence and the Connect app. And in between is this magical app, app migration platform. I'm making some assumptions today in the talk. I'm assuming that you're familiar with the server to cloud migration in general. You've performed some migrations, maybe tried to play with some code, try to get some app migration work done. We're only going to talk about Jira and Confluence today. And I'm assuming you have a Jira Confluence app on server and possibly an app in cloud. And we're specifically talking about Connect apps. If you have a Connect app and not a Forge one, there's another talk about Forge, which I highly recommend you go and listen to. From today, I'll go over server to cloud app migrations with custom data. I'll also cover core data only app migrations for Jira and Confluence. I'll cover some common issues and questions, some pitfalls and some best practices to help you develop your code for server to cloud app migration. And at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of me on the Developer Day Slack workspace. All of the documentation for cloud migration, app cloud migration is available on developer.icing.com slash platform slash app migration. We have example code, we have some tutorials, we have all the APIs available there for your view. So let's go and look at the server side of things. And specifically, we're talking, as I said, about P2 plugins on server. For app migration, you create a class and you implement and export the interface of discoverable listener. There are four methods in that interface which you need to override, which I'll talk about in a minute. And if you're dealing with Jira specifically, you can implement the Jira Cloud Migration Listener V1 instead, which includes the four main methods and two extra ones, which links and migrates workflows and custom fields. If you're using Maven, then you can add a dependency for the Atlassian App Cloud Migration Listener. If you're using a different package management tool, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to work out how to import and use our library. Now, the discoverable listener, as I said, has four methods that you need to implement. On start app migration, get server app key, get cloud app key, get data access scopes. One thing to note is get server app key has a default implementation and that defaults to your OSGI bundle name. If this is different to your server app key, then you must override and provide a server app key. The cloud app key must match your cloud app key in marketplace. This helps provide the glue between server and cloud, especially when you're doing testing and also in production migrations. The discoverable listener needs to be exported into the OSGI context. Here's an example of using the Java config method to export the listener. You can also use Spring Scanner version one or version two, depending on what version of Confluence or Jira that you're actually supporting. I recommend doing it this way, it's fun. Now the main method we're gonna be using for our server to cloud app migration is on start app migration. And in on start app migration, you have a couple of arguments. One is the transfer ID, which is used essentially as the glue between all of the things that we're going to do. Another one that you get us access to an object called the App Cloud Migration Gateway. And it has several methods in it which help us with our server to cloud app migration. The main one we'll be using, which I'll talk about a bit later in more detail, is create app data. It provides an output stream to send data to the app migration platform 
which can then be picked up on the Connect side and imported into your service. Feedback is a way for you to send data from your Connect side back through to server. It's just useful if you need to send any data back while you're processing the files to indicate that you need more information or more data from the server side. We also have access to the mappings between server and cloud. And I'll talk about this a little bit more, but in general, mappings provide the ID values of your server objects and your cloud objects, whether it be content IDs or issue IDs or project IDs or space IDs or whatever. You have access to all of those both in server and cloud, and in server, this is the way that it's done. Paginated containers provide you with a list of spaces or projects that were migrated in that specific migration. This is a little bit different to mappings because mappings provide you the IDs from all the previous migrations between one server and cloud instance, whereas the containers are just the projects or uh, spaces from that specific migration. You also have access to the migration details, which admittedly on server side, a few of these values are not so useful, but I think the most useful one is actually the name. This is really good for using in logging. So you can find out uh, a text description of what the migration is, which will help identify which one it was the customer did that might need some support. It's important to understand on startup migration runs in a thread, a single thread. So you don't need to start your own threads or handle your own multitasking. And each on startup migration are called, is called sequentially. Once one is, one is finished, it moves on to the next one. It's not within a database transaction, so you need to create your own database transaction. If you're accessing AO tables, use the AO table code for the transactions. If you're accessing a service within Confluence or Jira that needs a database transaction, you need to be responsible for creating that yourself. Also understand, since it runs in its own thread, no user is available in authenticated user thread local get, which means if you access any services, within Jira and Confluence requires an administrative user or a specific user to access something, you don't have access to that user. And so you need to create and construct your own authenticated user object. Let's talk about Create App Data in a little bit more detail. When you're using this on server, try to remember that you're on a customer's site, using a customer's network, going through the customer's firewall, the customer's router, or reverse proxy or whatever. So try to limit your file size to more than say about 50 megabytes in order to improve reliability of the transfers. Create a manifest file and send that first to track all the other files that are gonna be coming after it. Use labels and it helps you track the manifest and all subsequent files. And this helps you understand on the connect side, how much more work has to be done. Get data access scopes is about your, the security of the migration. You're specifically asking for access to data that might be GDP, GDPR data or product data. And so you need to provide that in access scopes. If you don't provide in access scopes, you don't have access to the mappings. The values you provide here appear in the user interface as part of the installation and approval of using your app. So the administrator will know what data you have access to. Let's talk a little bit more about Jira. The Jira App Cloud Migration Center V1 includes the four methods we've talked about already and two more methods to do with workflow rule mappings and custom field mappings. These, both these methods return maps of key values and on the server side, you provide the key of your workflow rules and for the cloud side for the workflow rules. And this helps the platform understand how that data is to be transferred and how it's to be linked together between server and cloud. Same goes for custom field mappings. It's a little bit more complex because you provide the name of the field and the type, as well as the cloud field value. Just to remember, this doesn't actually transfer all the data. You may need to package the data up yourself and send it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about core data migrations. I've also provided a QR code to the documentation that refers to these. And so we have an example code in libraries in the Bitbucket as well. Let's talk about mappings a little bit more. Mappings return all values from all migrations between server and cloud using one transfer ID. 
So if a customer has done many test migrations, the transfer ID from that you have access to will give you access to all the mappings from all the previous migrations between that server instance and that cloud instance. Here's an example of identity mappings for identity user, which again, if you've asked for the scope for this, then you'll have access to these mappings. And you can see here's an example for JIRA. We have a couple of the three example of the single user that's on JIRA side, and then the cloud ID of what that user will be. We also have paginated mappings, for example, the Confluence pages. Here we have three values of the server side IDs for pages and the cloud side IDs for pages. You have access to these in both server and cloud, so you can pre-process your data in server or post-process the data in cloud. It's important to understand that identity mappings are kept for 14 days for GDPR requirements. Product mappings are kept for two years. And we'll talk about this more a little bit later, but once a transfer is settled, that is it's successful, incomplete or failed or timed out, there's no more access to mappings for that transfer ID. Now, when you're on server and you're developing your code, you can run your app migration in dev mode. It allows you to run app migrations without marketplace migration data and with more frequent user interface updates. It updates every 60 seconds, except for every 10 minutes. You set this with a dark feature and there's a QR code there for the documentation link. It's really useful in testing to do this if you have your get server app key and get cloud app key configured correctly for your server app cloud, server app migration, then you can do testing without actually having a production cloud app or production migration code. Let's talk about the middle bits. So I talked a little bit about Marketplace API. There's an API in Marketplace that in order to do production server to cloud app migration, you have to provide data on some of your, uh, some of your APIs and some of your documentation and the value of your server app version. So for the marketplace migration data, you have to set a compatibility value, which is the minimum version of your app that supports app migration. Here's an example for Confluence questions, and we can see the cloud migration assistant compatibility value 2.7.34 is a semantic value, and it's the minimum version of the server app that supports cloud app migration. It's the only value you have to set with a migration endpoint in the marketplace data, but it's highly recommended you set all the values. You can provide documentation links for your migration path and feature differences. And all of this is used in app assessment. It helps admins to prepare for app migration and provides a link between server and cloud for the app migration platform. So just to remind you an app assessment where you have your app, the links will appear here under automated path and, and elsewhere, depending on what you provide. Something else about app assessment, it's important to remember is we have these values called stage one and stage two, and they represent app migration reliability. And I'll talk about that again towards the end. But so you understand app reliability is calculated based on success or incomplete rates of previous migrations. And I'll talk about what success and incomplete means as a progress status. So let's talk about the cloud side. And I'm specifically here talking about Connect. So in Connect, you register a webhook for each app install. It's best when you receive the enabled event against our API. It's not part of the Alassian Connect JSON blob. On that webhook, you receive events for listener triggered and app data uploaded events. Listener triggered comes when on start app migration is called and app data upload events is called when create app data is finalized. You respond with a HTTP 200 response straight away, and then you should process that event asynchronously, not wait until it's finished processing before you send your 200 response. If you receive those events, you must send status updates to ensure the transfer status appears in the user interface and records when the transfer is settled. If the transfer is settled, then this will affect your app reliability. So I'll talk about that now more. For progress reporting, we have a status API. Status updates must be sent with a percentage and optional message. You should start with the status of in progress and the zero percentage 
and then locally persist this value with a transfer ID and a timestamp. It helps you remember or understand or be able to log what work you've done already. And I'll talk about some opportunities later if you've missed any of these events. The user interface updates every 10 minutes for the admin, except when using dev mode, where it updates every 60 seconds. So you don't need to send more frequent in-progress status updates. So if you've recorded when you last sent an in-progress update, then you can just wait 10 minutes until you send the next one. So here's an example where I have a percentage of 50 then in progress. And that looks like this in the user interface when you're doing app migration. You can see there that it's running and my app is at 50% progress with a message of numbers two of three imported. Once a progress update of success, failed, or incomplete has been sent, the transfer is settled. You really should send one of those progress updates at the end because, it, as I said before, it affects your app reliability. Once settled, any REST endpoints that use a transfer ID will return a 400 response. This includes mappings, file uploads, whatever. So once you've processed all your data that's been uploaded and you've finished with everything that you have, then you send through success, failed, or incomplete. And then at that point, you have no access to mappings or anything else, and the transfer is considered settled. In the user interface, we can see here that it says it's complete, and it's at 100% with an ugly green tick. All transfers that are not settled within 14 days are marked as timed out, and that will affect your app reliability and app assessment. So it's really important during testing that you always send a success or incomplete status update with 100% completion rate in order to keep your app reliability as high as possible. So let's talk about some common pitfalls and problems we may have. So what could possibly go wrong? So what happens if I don't receive listener triggered or app data upload events? One thing to consider on your webhook endpoint is that we're sending you these endpoint messages. And if we don't get a 200 response, we'll send it again. And we have a bit of a fallback between sending the messages. And we send them repeatedly about eight to 10 times over three days. So we won't notify you if we can't send it. We just try and send it again and again and again, and it just times out and it bumps off the end of our queue. So you need to make sure that you're not responding with a 400. So you need to have logging of your, whether it be a firewall or whatever interface it is that you're receiving these on to make sure that you are receiving them correctly. But if you don't receive them and you know there are transfers happening, there's an endpoint called slash migration transfer recent that determines, lets you see what the most recent transfer up to 100 were that are not settled for one particular server, uh, one particular cloud instance. And it's really useful to do that regularly, just to see if you've missed any transfer IDs that you didn't persist earlier when you receive the listener triggered or app data uploaded events. Once you have transfer IDs that you may have missed, you can then pull the data transfer ID all endpoint, and this will tell you of all the files waiting to be processed. So you can then check which files you have processed, which ones you may have missed, and then you can start processing more. So what happens if I don't have any app data to send? Is my job done? Do I have anything left to do? In Confluence, core data is migrated as part of the Confluence Cloud Migration Assistant. This includes page macros, content, and space properties. If it's exported in a space, it's included in the core data migration. You don't need to implement a listener for core data-only migrations. When we talk about Jira, Core data is also migrated as part of the Jira Cloud Migration System. This includes custom fields and workflow rules, but not the values or any sort of extra glue you may have put in with Jira. So in that case, you will need to implement the Jira App Cloud Migration Listener V1 to provide links between server and cloud and also to upload custom data, which you then also need to send success or incomplete progress updates. And then you can use bulk APIs to update the data in Jira Cloud. If you do not implement a listener, then you will not receive listener triggered nor app data uploaded events, even if you've registered a webhook. You will not have access to mappings 
or any other endpoint that requires a transfer ID. This is really important. If you need to access Confluence Cloud and say, for example, process macros, you need to work out how to do that yourself because you won't be notified of the migration and you can use CQL or so on just to access those macros and do the updates that you need. With core data only migrations, you do not or you cannot send progress updates. And so the interface will just show failed. What you need to do then is log a developer support ticket with me and with your server and cloud app keys and we'll add it to a reliable list, which then indicates that your app is a core data only migration. And it will just appear as completed 100% straight away in app migration. So let's review some of the important bits. If you register a listener, you must send progress updates and settle the transfer. Otherwise, the user interface will not update. Customers and admins will think that the app transfer is not completed and your app reliability will not go to stage two. Mappings access all data from all migrations between that server instance and that cloud instance, not just ones related to the latest transfer. So if you're expecting to get just a few IDs, you may get thousands and thousands. Once the transfer is settled, the transfer ID cannot be used. So remember that once you've marked it as successful or incomplete or failed or timed out, you can't access the data for the mappings or the file uploads anymore. If you have a core data only migration and you don't need to register a listener, log a developer support ticket with your app keys and we'll add it to our internal reliable list. After this, you have an opportunity to ask questions and I'll be answering them in the developer day Slack workspace. And I also recommend you go and listen to the Automating the Migrations of App Data for P2 Plugin to Forge App Talk, which my colleague is giving after this. Thank you. Have a great day. Music